With no further ado, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Sasha McGill, who's uh, Head of Sustainability at WE, uh, which is a large construction company, for those of you who are not familiar with it. And uh, Sasha's going to talk to us today about uh, design and delivery of sustainable buildings. Uh, Sasha's an architect, she has 10 years uh, practical experience, and she's currently undertaking um, a leadership master's at um, sustainability at Cambridge. And uh, she leads the sustainability hub within WE, which she says is an enthusiastic team of experts um, at the forefront of the company's commitment to deliver true sustainability for its clients. So without further ado, Sasha. Hello. Um, 
and you have to fit all our needs within this one planet. So the, the, the concept has been further developed by Stockholm Resilience Institute to, to take a look at these nine planetary boundaries, meaning how far can we push um, our consumption, how far can we push our impact on the planet before it actually breaks. And it actually turned out that two of the impacts which I've highlighted um, in red are already beyond planetary boundaries. I don't know if you've seen it in the news that uh, we are on the brink of uh, sixth, uh, sixth great extinction uh, in terms of biodiversity. Um, on the previous months was the Ice Age, so uh, it's quite serious. I won't worry about this, we are here to talk about energy, just one more thing. Um, the nine impacts have been then further uh, developed by Oxfam to include, so we've got the external boundaries, meaning how far we can push but also how far can we can squeeze the society before it cracks. Uh, so these are the internal limits that they've added. Um, and I, I quite like this framework because it does explain uh, quite a lot uh, about sustainability. Now why I'm here and why there's construction company we are interested, the built environment has a huge impact. These, I've just picked two of the greatest ones, and one of the left we're particularly interested in. This is not just for the operation of the building, it's also for building on buildings, uh, from producing the materials that need to go into that, converted into carbon emissions, it's a huge impact. And this is 45% of all human activity. That includes transport, food, um, travel, uh, anything, any car, manufacture of any clothing that you bought, any uh, laptops. So out of all of that, 45% is down to uh, what I do on a daily basis. So it's, it's quite boring. But the good news is that if you build green, you can reduce quite a, quite a large um, amount of this impact. Especially what I'm interested in is, of course, the energy and CO2 emissions, but also solid waste. I mean, this part normally doesn't get translated into uh, carbon. But actually, if you think about it, uh, this, there's a lot of waste of energy uh, in this waste. Uh, so trying to recycle as much as we can is also one of our major points. Also, green buildings can build, uh, to, they sort of can reduce the impact, but they can also bring something to the table. So uh, this is a report by the Green Building Council that was presented at the beginning of our session, EcoBuild. Um, it shows, among other things, what I've done is to try to sell green buildings. One of the main problems of green buildings that is everybody saying, well, they're more expensive, why would we invest in them? But actually, they rent better, and they sell better, they retain their value value. Um, so this is quite a, a strong economic uh, reason to consider green buildings. Now, I've uh, got two keys in finishing with the sustainability in general, okay? Very more practical. Uh, just give you two two things that I, I consider keys to sustainable thinking, if you like. And because it's probably going to come out as a little bit of a disappointment in the common sense, I've used photos of pets. Um, so don't be not nearsighted, don't think, don't be blinkered. You have to have a wider view. Okay, you have to think about everything. Um, and, and sort of how does what I'm doing here impact something else? This is and also, um, work as a team, don't work in silos. To give you a more um, practical um, example of what this really means, in the um, in UK, especially in London, uh, it was quite popular to build uh, buildings with biomass borders, um, maybe 10 years ago, something like that. Um, so they were, they were sold as quite sustainable buildings, very efficient, you're reusing waste material. Um, so M energy, um, M&E engineers who designed this wonderful plant, it's going to have this wonderful and efficient building, but it didn't count on the impacts of this principle. So biomass borders need storage in central London, that's it's quite expensive, it's quite difficult to, to find space, and moreover it needs this mass to be brought in London on a regular basis. So you've got all the traffic uh, impacts of the cost of uh, delivering this, but also the carbon emissions of all of these lorries bringing 
these certifications, any certifications, are really audits. Um, trying to find a balance between all the categories that we looked at before. It works very simply. So you've got all the categories lined up like that, and you can, you can achieve a certain number of points in each category. Um, and you know that you're not going to achieve 100%. It's, it's nearly impossible. So what you try to do is, is find the right solution for your building, what you can afford to lose, what you need to achieve definitely, and, and you know, get your solution, whatever it is, uh, get to your, your score, uh, whatever it is, in the most sustainable, the best way. And it will differ from project to project. Uh, one of the criticism um, certifications get a lot is that it's um, incredibly annoying, it's a lot of paperwork. Uh, if any of you have uh, anything to do with any certifications, you will know that this is uh, absolutely correct. I'm a green assessor and code assessor, and uh, I, I know what it is. It's really a lot of paperwork. But as it is in audit, it is going to be a lot of paperwork. What I can tell you from practice, it does work. It really does work. Um, I know that on a project, for all sorts of reasons, uh, certain things would have been lost or not done uh, if we didn't have a certification to, to push through as a priority. So you would have a planning condition linked to the pre-maximum. We know we need to achieve 25% improvement to a part health. But we know that the building has to do this. Um, so there's, you know, even if the client is pushing us to, to cut out certain things, even if something's not working, we have to find a way to make this work. So it does work in practice. Yes, it's painful, but it does work. There will always be the flagship buildings the most sustainable buildings that uh, whoever is building them or designing them is um, advertising them the best in class, of course. But if you want to move the bulk, you need to have certification. The passive house, um, this is the German system which really concentrates on energy performance. So the idea is that this uh, building, and it, can, it doesn't have to be a house, you know, it's not a house, it can be anything has very low uh, energy demand. And this is achieved quite simply by super insulating the building. So you've got insulation truly wraps around, somebody says, like a duvet around the building, and it's much thicker, much, much uh, stronger than what you normally have uh, in a building. So if the insulation goes from 150 uh, millimeters, sorry, uh, typically to 300 millimeters, and going underneath the building as well, which is uh, very unusual. Looking at the windows, they have to have uh, triple glazing, so you don't have uh, a loss of energy through, through windows and glazing. You also need to model correctly and include the calculation or thermal bridging. So first you need to try and avoid them, of course, and this is why timber is quite uh, popular for passive houses, because timber functions as a little bit of an insulator, at least in comparison with the metal. Um, but if you do have them, you will have them, then you have to include it very precisely in the calculation. Um, also, the air tightness, so air changes. In, in a concrete building, you will achieve about 2, uh, this is 0 0.6, so it's a concrete building by definition, it's in situ, it's going to be sealed box, it's going to be a achieve in the years. And what you want this is your uh, MBHR, it doesn't have to be the mechanical ventilation with heat recovery, it doesn't have to be mechanical, but you need the heat recovery, that is the key thing. So before you chuck out all the warm air out in the, in the cold, you grab all the heat back and reintroduce it to the building. Of course, um, they have the, the very strict rules about how this is assessed, how the building is built. It's really um, increases the, the requirements of site especially. If you want to achieve, for example, air guidance like this, there is no room for error at all. Um, so the QA, um, the, the, the principles of building such a building um, are completely different uh, than your standard um, round the uh, house. What, it's, it's wonderful, you've got a very comfortable building, you have requirements for uh, thermal comfort, for, for um, um, lighting levels, like that. So you, you really like to use this building because low energy requirements, but it's not really a sustainable building. It might be, it could be a bit controversial, but it's missing quite a lot. Um, and 
this is all that. So this is what you make it from. So you can buy your timber from Brazilian forests and knock down the last species of the planet and build your building. If it complies with the energy requirements, it's fine, it's better house. You can pollute the environment, you can knock down the uh, forest and build it instead. It's still a passive house, but all the other impacts that you have, we cannot not discuss. So what we do uh, in, in cases where we want to build a passive house, we add all the categories back um, and, and uh, include them in our projects regardless. So we had a, a, the first passive house in London, for example, we had the requirement to build it in green. I said, okay, well, now we'll build it the passive house. And we'll add everything that passive house misses. So in comparison with green, very good, which didn't really have many uh, energy requirements. This is a very uh, efficient, very comfortable building. Plus, it has everything else that would have been neglected normally uh, in, in, a, in a passive house. OK, so looking at regulations again, this is where we're getting at. So uh, zero carbon definition. Um, the domestic buildings in UK have to be theoretically zero carbon for next year, 2016, and non-domestic buildings will have to be zero carbon in 2019. In EU, uh, we have nearly zero, uh, nearly zero energy buildings as well coming up, which is slightly different uh, definition. One of the problems is the zero, zero carbon definition is quite unclear uh, in the UK. Uh, so what it means up to, what, what do we know? So it first means you need to have a very efficient fabric, very efficient shape of the building. So um, you orient it right to have all the heat that it should gain, but not too much. So the, the cooling uh, uh, requirements don't go uh, too far up. So for offices, for example, it's much more important to shape the building rather than, than to get as much as much as possible. Good insulation, so things like passive house, all of those uh, measures that they have, like air tightness, the triple glazed windows. This is the elemental efficiency, okay? So your basic box. And of course, thinking about it, uh, what, one of the things is that the more complicated the shape you get, the so, um, more loss you have from the facade. So, yes, the box is the most efficient shape, and the more uh, creative you get, the more problems you get. Uh, next thing is the baseline energy, so what you feed the building, uh, how you run it, your ventilation, your heating, your lighting, things like that. So these systems need to be as efficient as possible, your LED lighting, CO2 plants, things like that. And then you try and mitigate as much as you can um, on site. So you put your uh, low zero carbon technology on site, you put PV, so you use ground source, air source or maybe even uh, if you have a, a windmill or something like that, to try and produce as much energy as possible in a green way on site. But of course, especially in London, for example, this is not quite possible. So in that case, you've got the larval solutions. Now, this is the part we don't really know about. Uh, the, 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 how it's going to be calculated, how it's going to be dealt with, we don't know. The government has yet to, to produce or publicize uh, the rules uh, on this. What a lot of solution means that, okay, you've got some carbon that you're using up on your site, you're not able to offset it on the site, so you have to do it somewhere else. You have to invest in a field of PVs or, or uh, uh, windmills or wind turbines, or you invest in uh, a wind carbon reduction scheme or in uh, uh, something that's going to reduce the energy consumption somewhere else. But how it's going to calculate how much you need to pay. And that is for regulated energy. So that is for your basic stuff to trans the building. So again, lighting, cooling, heating, things like that. But there's also the unregulated energy, which is everything you plug in. Um, your computers, your projectors, the washing machine, everything, everything else. Yes. And that, that bit actually is not that small. Uh, and I'll, I'll get back to that, but it's that this is the problem really um, that we get uh, in terms of um, delivering the performing buildings, the unregulated energy, especially. Uh, 
uh, okay, the, the rules that we got from 2016 and 2019 are zero carbon, not true zero carbon. So only regulated energy needs to be addressed. Another thing that's um, really important is doing things in the right time. So timing uh, in the sustainability is crucial. Um, and this has been picked up by various bodies. Has anybody seen this? This is BIM small buildings. It's, it's called but McLean's club. McLean is an architect. Um, and he sort of produced this read to illustrate how important it is to use BIM early on, to sort of try and move all the decisions as, as early as possible. It's common sense. Um, the sooner you make your decision determining the design changes, the less it's going to cost. And believe me, this is, this is absolute truth. The longer we wait with our projects, we want to implement any changes, it costs more. And sometimes there is, there is just a cut of point in the time to it. Well, actually, it's not that, that new. This is from 1976, uh, from a paper. Um, it's the same thing, it's the same curve without uh, funky uh, animation. And it means the same, the longer you wait, the worse you are. So what has been done about this? Um, this is RABA's plan of work. This is the Bible that we use for um, um, our projects, for managing our projects. Is anybody unfamiliar with this? No, good. What you've got in there are sustainability checkpoints, meaning what you need to do in each stage of the project. Okay, we, we really use this. That has been then translated into for example, in green 2014, you've got, again, linked to river stages, <coughs> certain things you need to do, otherwise the red means too late. So how do you address this? Uh, very early on, you've got some concept design, then you've got the energy model, and you do the cover analysis if you do it at all, and you do cost analysis, and the time passes, you do the life cycle costing if you do it, you get some results, and you figure out, oh, actually, we need to change something, in the design where the time is passed and we don't have time anymore. And this is the real problem we have now in visibility stages. So what we've been working on with um, a number of consultants and engineers is a tool uh, that puts it all together. So you've got full assessment in one point of time, in a very early well. So it says design here, it's really constant design. Okay. So what it does, this is how it looks like, you can also import the sketch of one It does your life cycle cost, it does your body carbon and operation carbon. And it's really meant for optioneering, so you have a, a, an idea of how the building might perform um, if you change certain things. Of course, this is not a compliance tool, you can't get your part tell uh, compliance for this. This is very early on. Design level is this for a sketch up model. So of course you're going to have errors. But the idea is that you have a direction, uh, something to give you um, an indication of what is the best solution for your, for your project. Um, the main point here is that you can produce all of these results, and I think I've got 10 options in here, in about 10 minutes. Uh, of course, setting them up takes a bit longer, but producing the results, uh, the, the, the scatter chart I'm not sure it's showing there, takes about 10, 10 15 minutes. So it's really, really fast. Uh, our involvement there was mostly on certification, being the one of the things that we do. Uh, but the tool itself has been developed by uh, BDSB Chapman, a uh, suite group, uh, Green Space Life Programming, and Architect. What they've done here, they've done templates. So you apply a template to any of these, and change certain things in terms of the sizes and the quantities of things, but the templates really tell you uh, what happens uh, in each situation. Works really well. So, thinking about, so that's the feasibility stage, that's the analysis stage that gives you an idea where you need to go. But you need to keep in mind everything else that needs to happen. So this is the BIM building information model and chart, and I'm sure you can have seen it many times. And I really want to bring this home that, you, that once the building design, you 
needs to think about the destruction, especially the demolition, trying to reduce the waste, uh, trying to use the carbon belly to move the waste from out. And that then gets translated to one of the ways is that we can try and reduce the are the errors. Um, so what we do is translate the BIM model into Synchro to try out how the buildings were to actually build the site uh, and then try out all the phases and make sure everything works right. Really works out. I'm not a BIM person, uh, but we've already seen uh, quite a lot of um, benefits in this. Quite possibly the future. The good thing about Rapier is it actually talks to downstream uh, BIM tools, so you can take them all and put it in the uh, ID-CAD, you can put it in a task for managing modeling and then get results from that. Performance gap, again, is something that uh, I'm sure many of you heard about. And I mentioned that when I was uh, explaining the pyramid. We have a problem, and the buildings don't actually perform as well as themselves. And this is an industry problem, industry work. This is from carbon bars. So where it's coming from, this is what you would model in Partel energy modeling. So you, you think on, you think about normally about regulated energy. There are some assumptions about unregulated energy, but they're not particularly precise. And the problem is that you get all of this. You get building not being used as it was intended in the model, but it could be the model's problem or the building's problem. And you also have the inefficiency, which also include errors in the build and errors in the maintenance. Okay. So all of this can mount up to more than what you put the buildings twice sometimes than the building was supposed to use. The solution has been proposed by Bistria uh, is a process called soft landings. So going back, these inefficiencies, and this extra occupancy, one of the things why they happen is because we didn't design the building for the actual use and maintenance. And this is because, going back to my pets, because people worked in their silos. They worked in their little boxes and didn't talk to the actual users and the actual facility managers, the actual contractors even, uh, that are going to build this building. Okay. So you've got super complicated controls, so people don't know how to deal with super complicated plans that the managers don't know how to maintain. They have to be trained. That's one of the things that you need to involve uh, the users, uh, contractors, and FM. Uh, in the early stages of the consultation. And then review the design periodically. When the building gets, gets um, built, but one of the key points is the pre-handover process. Again, making sure that all the testing is done right, but even more importantly, that facilities managers know what to do with the building and the users know what to do with the building. So you don't, as a contractor, hand over a key and ride off in the sunset. You actually hand over the building. This is quite a period of time. It's not just one month. It actually extends to a year or two years, where, where you present the site to begin with, and then go back um, and help and reassess the building and maybe recommission the building. Definitely recommission seasonally, but even a year after, uh, it, it could be necessary to recommission. This is. Soft landings has been adopted by the government, so for all central government projects, it's going to be mandatory for next year. So together with BIM level two, uh, and this is the information exchanges there, this relates to BIM and soft landings, because they didn't come together. Um, all, all central government projects will require this, and I have a feeling that uh, local governments are going, to, are going to pick up on this, and clients as well. It's very important. So, a couple of uh, not only two projects um, here, they won't bore you too much. Uh, the first one is the University of Hertfordshire. We are just finishing, no, actually, we finished phase one, and the Energy Center is finishing very soon. Phase two is on site, and phase three is planned for next year. This is student accommodation, including a, a student hub, which is there. And why is it interesting, especially for this uh, audience, is it's true zero carbon. 
So this does include the unregulated energy. <coughs> okay, we had to be very careful about how we designed and built and going to maintain this, um, this project. And the reason for this is that we are bound contractually to deliver a performing building. So you living, this is a, a consortium of designers, contractors, and facilities managers, we have to deliver um, student accommodation is going to be chosen by contract. So we had to really, really very carefully design our buildings. So all the, the uh, M&E engineering is going into there, all the, especially the unregulated energy. Uh, we have to really map out carefully to make sure that it works, so that uh, we can guarantee that it's something in my view, and this is something that we are really working on as a company, this is guarantee of performance from your design and contractors, FMP, preferably they're all together bound in a contract is really something that's going to as, as well deliver a performance gap. The motivation is that um, in the contract. So what the building does, um, it's biomass. I know I've talked a lot uh, dirty about biomass, but it's not all bad. There's quite a lot of biomass around the worst of so you don't have much of a transport impact, and it is a waste material. Um, it gets burnt, um, you get, uh, but it's not directly used uh, like that. Uh, from the burn, synthetic, synthetic gas is extracted, cooled, and then again combusted with an engine, which is specially designed for this. It's a CHP plant, and it will recover. It's combined heat and power plants. It will recover extra heat and convert it into power, into electricity. Okay. And uh, we made sure that uh, one of the things about CHP plants is that you don't want them to turn off and on. I'm sure you know about this. So we made sure that there's enough load at all times uh, to, to make this really efficient system. And all the extra power is then exported <coughs> to the network. Now, I said that choose your carbon um, is, is achieved at this project. It has been achieved without any low zero carbon technologies. Solely the first two steps, so elemental and plant efficiency. There's no, no field of PVs um, uh, producing uh, green energy. It's just simply efficient, uh, efficient design. So it is possible. And of course, it's pretty outstanding. It got quite a lot of innovation credits um, for the, the energy, the near center for the design of this um, energy. Actually, if you read Green Manual, strictly speaking, you shouldn't get these credits because BRE didn't want projects to be or buildings to be designed as power plants and get credits there. But actually, the efficiencies of this project are uh, what, what drives this to zero carbon. So we bought a special 5% for this particular project, for this particular solution, a particular innovation. Um, um, they recognize that it's not a power plant, it's just truly. And then there is Challenger. Um, this is our head office, and there's a little video uh, which will explain a bit better. Uh, head office, sorry, in France. It will explain a little bit better what we've done there. Uh, it has achieved uh, pre month standing lead platinum and H3, its French uh, scheme, and we put it to bring the lead. Excellent, so outstanding as well. Uh, top uh, in all categories. It has a few PVs, but this is because this is an existing building, so it's a refurbishment project that we need to do uh, quite a lot of reduce the energy consumption. It was built in, in the era when uh, energy was not an issue. Challenger opened in 1988. The site, which was designed on the initiative of Francis Bouy, was at the forefront of technology and already demonstrated the group's capacity for innovation. In 2008, an ambitious renovation project was launched that did not necessitate closing the offices. Its aim was to return Challenger to its role as a showcase for our expertise. In line with the values of Bouy Construction, the project is aiming for a triple environmental certification, HQE, LEED and BREAM. 
three principles have guided the renovation of Challenger. Improving energy efficiency, producing green energy, enhancing staff comfort. The main challenge of an approach aimed at sustainable renovation was reducing energy consumption. An audit of Challenger's thermal efficiency was therefore carried out. Two avenues for improvement were identified as a result. Improving the insulation of walls and terraces, replacing the existing facade with a naturally ventilated double skin wall. Managing water consumption was also a major concern. A phytopurification facility allows the 100% natural treatment of waste and rainwater without discharge into the public network. Water consumption has been reduced by almost 60% by reusing wastewater on site. Natural resources are also used to produce a proportion of the site's energy requirements. 75 boreholes and a geothermal doublet in the groundwater table provide controlled heating for buildings. 21,500 square meters of photovoltaic panels provide almost 2,000 megawatt hours of electricity per year, which is used directly in the running of Challenger. The installation of 420 square meters of thermal solar panels produces half the domestic hot water requirements for the staff restaurant and gymnasium. To optimize the use of all this equipment, a cockpit was created. It is a veritable control tower into which all information is fed. The cockpit also has a hypervision area for the remote management of buildings operated by Group Subsidiary Exprim, which specializes in facility management. The renovation of Challenger also provided an opportunity to improve staff working conditions. Particular attention has been paid to visual, acoustic and olfactory comfort in the office space. The number of meeting rooms has been increased by 50% and they're equipped with flat screens, video projectors or video conferencing systems. 111 mini meeting rooms were also created in the open plan office areas so that discussions can take place in complete confidentiality. Challenger boasts outstanding performance levels. Primary energy consumption has reduced tenfold, falling from 310 to 31 kilowatt hours per square meter each year. Water consumption has been reduced by 60%. Almost 2,000 megawatt hours of photovoltaic energy is produced each year. Challenger's renovation thus provides an opportunity for Bui Construction to establish itself as a major player in sustainable renovation, playing its part in the creation of a better living and working environment for all. Uh, we 
free to um, put it in the US, expand our cities horizontally, and then you have all the impacts of transport and to drive everywhere uh, and the impacts of that. Or you have uh, a building uh, which has its own impacts in a different way. In a sense, what you need to do is, in each particular situation, try and assess what is the best way. But this is on a neighborhood level. You need to think about city level. Is it better to put a building in a city, which is going to be somewhere else, you can transport issues, all the new infrastructure issues, um, bringing, making people want to go there. In Mazda City, as far as I know, has researchers in there, and people who are paid to live there. So you have this wonderful For me, in London, we see situations such as that, uh, yes, tall buildings are sustainable. Looking at the overall picture, looking okay, about all the needs that you have, the right way to put them, yes, it makes sense. And again, trying to find a balance between the three social, environmental, and economic. Somewhere else, in um, rural areas, of course, building a huge tower does not make sense. Um, in terms of life, life cycle, uh, life cycle assessments normally stop at 60 years. The, the official things that you would do for and the certification such as that. But of course, we're not going to live longer than that. Uh, in which case, we're going to do a more maintenance routine and that would make sense. Um, I, would, I would suggest that we need to do the longer life cycle assessments. <coughs> Stephen Bradley from uh, Kingston University. Um, I was quite interested in what you said about the performance gap and you began to talk a bit about the um, use of soft landings. Yes. And you also talked a bit about the project in Hertfordshire University yes. where you are claiming to dealt with the regulated emissions yes. which are unregulated and therefore yes. sort of unquantified. Um, I'm quite interested to, to, know, to know how you did that, but the, the, key, the key question I have is um, to what extent are you actually going into completed schemes and quantifying and collecting information and data to, to, to ascertain how big that, that gap is, how much you know, real post, post occupancy valuation you do? Uh, which we actually did soft landings. We didn't call it soft landings, but we did uh, proper soft landings. Um, by definition, part of your living is a facilities manager. Uh, so, so we had them on board all the time, uh, picking that information. Uh, we had with development, who was the development arm, and with construction, who was the construction arm. So you sort of have this bit, and then, of course, the clients and students. Um, Yes, I'm regular with energy is a little bit of an unknown, but you can have a pretty educated guess, but not using the other standard tools and standard uh, templates, but actually looking into how the students live in the existing accommodation, uh, what are their patterns of uh, movement, so when are they in the, in the dormitories, when they're actually um, in the lectures, or what sort of equipment they're using. So we did a very, very thorough analysis of that to make sure that our unregulated unknown is less than that. In terms of, uh, so for this particular project, we'll monitor the performance and be present there in the next 50 years. Um, for other projects, it depends whether we allow it or not. So some clients want us to hand over and leave. They don't want to uh, publish the, their pieces. And they don't want us to know what they're doing. So in these cases, we can't. Um, especially in passive house buildings, we, we have done the post occupancy regulation but we have four schools now, and schools especially are, are more amenable to, to this collaboration, so monitoring the performance, going back, engaging with the students and the pupils, and this works very well. So we've done the analysis and we do actually uh, perform quite nearly, that there's always a performance gap, even in passive house buildings. And simply because um, people, people 
for example, in one of the, the schools, we had an issue with, um, um, it didn't quite work out well. We didn't quite understand what's going on. We tested it again um, to check the commissioning. Everything was fine. It actually turned out that um, in passing out, you can't do the sunlight. This is in Birmingham, so we want a little bit more uh, because it's cold. Mm -hmm. And uh, the problem was that the arts teacher was using the windows as a display uh, case, so the, the light wasn't coming through. We didn't get all the heat that you needed, so the front windows went out. Simple as that. Um, very often, yeah, or in a uh, Classic House conference last year, they had a done analysis of it's not our project uh, of the passive house development. They went back to take a look at how it's performing. And of course, in relation to normal buildings, the, the performance gap is small, but there are some that really went out. Uh, you know, the, the average in the sun was really uh, that bad. And this is because people left the windows open and the doors open. They simply not using the building properly. Or turned off the MBHR. And maybe they turned it off because it was placed next to their bedroom and they couldn't sleep. It's quite noisy, so that's a bad design. Um, or, or they simply uh, don't want that, they want to open the windows, they don't understand how they're going to work. So there's quite a lot of the, the, the initial stages of the design, and then the part of understanding the client and what they want, and how they want to use the building is really important. Uh, and in some cases, uh, we develop projects where we are the developer and the contractor, but yet to really start from zero from scratch. Um, and we usually have the client um, on board as well. And there's quite a lot of projects where we get in um, stage four, so the technical design comes to finish, so we can do a little bit and then build it to the best of our ability and commission and handover. But initial stages um, um, are beyond our reach. Um, so those projects are more complicated, I would suggest. Especially with the other equipment. Great presentation. Thanks very much, Lee. Council Marshall, Department of Energy and Climate. A bit of an unfair question. Um, but 80% of the buildings that we're going to have in 2050 have already been built. Have you got any advice for what we do with those? Refurbishment, yes. Um, we do uh, quite a lot of refurbishment projects, uh, actually. Um, and one of the things that you have sort of presented mostly on your, actually all of the work is in your build. There are tools uh, that there is bring the purpose, for example, uh, and I'm going to do this. And I'm going to unfairly criticize a uh, great deal, which didn't uh, quite, uh, quite work out. Um, one of the mentions of the, uh, zero carbon heart, or carbon zero carbon, was that a lot of solutions might involve investing in green schemes. Um, and I thought that that could be quite interesting, quite a lot of uh, big developments to, to actually go out and refurbish um, um, somebody's home to improve their carbon emissions. Um, we need to refurbish I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no, no much, not much philosophy about it. And it's actually possible um, to convert uh, some of these old buildings into uh, passive houses. Uh, in my view, it's much better to refurbish than to demolish in almost all cases uh, because of the current carbon. Um, even, even if you repound everything and leave just the structure, it's still a huge amount of work to uh, not to mention time and everybody uh, uh, to build that uh, and the all the impacts that you would have from a site starting off from scratch. Um, so, whenever it's possible, it's better to, to refurbish. Is that the question? Yeah. Or did I miss it? No, no. Yeah. Um, Simon Foxall from the Architects Practice. In your definitions of sustainability, the whole series of categories, none of them actually addressed um, the life of the building itself, how long it would, it would last, how easy it is um, to do that refurbishment. Yeah. Um, there is now a tendency, certainly in this country, to build buildings as tightly as possible to um, a, a specification that is about now and is not about adaptability into the future. I would definitely include adaptability and durability into my definitions of sustainability. They're key to the word itself. Yet somehow they've, they've escaped. 
They haven't actually. Um, the management category has life cycle costing. Um, so to look and, and be a reader is going to be 60 years, not 30 or 40, which is normally uh, down to the sort of um, um, losses. So it does have that. You have the designing for robustness uh, part, which is materials. You've got in the new green 2014, you've got adaptation to climate change, you've got uh, designing out waste, you've got um, materials use reduction as well. So you've got this sort of wider uh, wider subject and I absolutely agree with you. Again, a building that needs to be knocked down in, in 10 years because it can't be adapted to new use or the conditions which are coming actually is not a same building. So yes, um, and again thinking about my pets long term view and uh, what's going to happen uh, in 20 years time how is this going to be close to 40 years time we will change it to an hour coming uh, is, is crucial so absolutely agree with that it is it is you know I didn't invent uh, the schemes as uh, so they're being updated and a new update to 2014 does address exactly these issues a few things there uh, in context of things like the uh, ECO standard for Offices, you know, 18 meters deep plates, relatively shallow, shallow floor to floor heights, which won't necessarily be adaptable in the future. And those are the sorts of standards that are still being used extensively. So. One of the things that it does is um, uh, beauty. Yeah. Uh, and I, I really, uh, uh, I think you, you can't build monsters and um, call it sustainable. Yeah. Uh, and there is, uh, there's a scheme which is, as far as I know, there's only one building in Ireland that's going to do that. It's called Living Building Challenge. It's incredible. It's difficult, which is why it's difficult, isn't it? Um, you don't have the tools. You have to do everything. And one of the, uh, um, quite a lot of it is about uh, being an inspiration of some beautiful space. Um, and I think that's incredible. Uh, and we try to do that as much as we can. Uh, we should think it should be included uh, in, in the assessment. The difficulty, of course, is how you assess that. There is no number uh, for beauty. Uh, you can't say that it has to be 96 to 90 years. It's not that easy for the buildings. The places are so very different, uh, which is probably why it was avoided. Uh, uh, still needs to exist somehow. And it was a thinking of um, Thank 
designed to be to, hopefully it will be you know, soon feasible to the facility to uh, your energy generator. So you don't, the, as you will all know, there's a two sides of the debate. Do we try to make our buildings as energy efficient as possible? Do we try to make our energy as green as possible? So we don't care how energy efficient the buildings are, of course we should. But in some cases, you will have an iconic building, which is being refurbished, so that there's, there's a value to it, like uh, apartment, for example. It's never going to be energy efficient. But it is, that its value uh, is immense. Its social value is immense. Of course, you're not going to demolish that and build an efficient building. But what you, what you can do is try and offset uh, the carbon footprint of uh, like that um, in various ways.